Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout Taylor. Every year, public health is threatened by unknown mosquito borne diseases that tend to be transmitted in the warmest areas of the United States, like California, Florida, and Texas. Certain mosquito borne diseases, like Zika, for instance, can easily be transmitted by blood transfusion, which is why Dr. Benjamin and Obi Greenman of Cirrus Corporation have worked with hospital systems and blood centers around the world to reduce the risk of transmission through pathogen reduction, which ensures that hospital patients are receiving clean, disease, and virus-free blood. This is an urgent and important part of the medical conversation right now, especially as we are all much more attuned to pandemics and all of the impacts that they can have on our society. Dr. Benjamin is Chief Medical Officer of Cirrus Corporation, and Obi Greenman is President and CEO of Cirrus. Thank you both so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you for the invitation. So, Dr. Benjamin, you've spent 13 years as uh, Chief o- uh, Medical Officer for the American Red Cross, and then, of course, have played an integral role at Cirrus. We'd love to know... Um, You know, it's interesting. Our team started preparing for our conversation with both of you today, and we saw, of course, the American Red Cross focuses on disaster relief and provides a staggering 40% of the nation's blood and blood components. Can you tell us more about the innovations that that you're both currently working on at Cirrus and why they're so critical in today's time? Safe blood is something we all expect. But after the HIV epidemic, I think we all have this nagging fear that perhaps what we're not getting is as safe as we would like it to be. The Cirrus Corporation is, has developed a, a series of technologies to actually uh, almost sterilize blood products so that you can treat a blood donation after donation. And if there's anything in the blood that could harm a patient from an infectious disease sense, Uh, we can inactivate it and uh, protect patients. Uh, That innovation for me is is, is the culmination of almost a lifelong journey from my days when I was medical director of one of the Harvard blood banks and I actually saw patients that were affected by bacterially contaminated platelets or hepatitis C. Uh, It also impacted my time when I served as chief medical officer for the American Red Cross where I could see I was responsible for the safety of almost half of the country's blood supply. And you would see reports coming in. They weren't that common, but they were common enough to know that there were still problems with diseases such as West Nile virus and Zika and other infectious diseases. So Cirrus really, to my, to my mind, provides a solution that can really um, protect patients. And that's what really motivates and drives me. Can you share? Uh, thank yeah, you. Just so, add, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Just to add to that, um, yeah, I think the, a lot of the employees at Cirrus you know, have a similar experience to Richard where we were really impacted by the HIV and hepatitis uh, epidemics back in the 80s and 90s and the impact on blood safety at that time and the, and the fear that existed for both physicians and patients who were receiving blood components about what might be in, in a blood uh, unit. And so uh, the founder of the company, Dr. Larry Korash, who was at UCSF uh, in the 80s, you know, really embodies that kind of uh, spirit of innovation of you know, how do you solve this problem prospectively so that with future epidemic threats, you don't have risk to the blood supply and you ensure its availability. Uh, you know, I had a similar experience in my early career at Baxter Healthcare where we were making blood-derived therapeutics for diseases like hemophilia, but also for other uh, patient populations that were being compromised. And the big fear at that time was, are we going to transmit uh, an unknown virus uh, in our, in our, in our blood, blood drive therapeutics? And so it really has been a lifelong dream for many of the employees of Cirrus to try and come up with a new foundational strategy for blood safety and availability. It's such important work. Can you tell us about the culture of innovation inside Cirrus and what led your teams to get to this point of, of discovering some of these, these new, uh, would you call them technologies that, that you've produced or uh, processes for, for cleaning and 
Well, I'd say it's a technology that, that is it's a, basically a photochemical approach to sterilized blood, as Richard uh, mentioned. And, you know, our main focus is on uh, the clinical benefit for patients. And, and I think, uh, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of sort of history of the company about uh, disease transmission through blood components and how we prevent that. And I think, uh, you know, the impact also is just the, the scope of what we're doing on patients globally is, is huge because there's so many patients who get blood components on a daily basis. Uh, and it's also estimated that 40% of the population will get some kind of blood blood component or blood derived therapeutic in their lifetime. So our main, main focus is on the clinical benefit uh, that we can confer to patients. And, uh, and also, you know, it's really providing our, our customers, which are blood centers around the world that process blood components, they collect and, and process them uh, before they're distributed to hospitals to help those blood centers do whatever they can in their power to ensure the safety and, and also the availability of blood. Maybe I can add to that. You know, at Cirrus, I've met a really dedicated uh, group of people who really see the patient as, as the end, uh, end result of, of our technologies. Um, we, there's this desire to really do the best to develop the best technologies, the simplest and cheapest technologies that can be implemented to, to protect patients. And that's one of the driving forces why this, the company that's now you know, almost 27 years old has, has just persevered and succeeded in expanding its, um, its footprint worldwide um, into almost every continent in the world now. And it's critically important, like I mentioned when we first kicked off this conversation, for mosquito-borne diseases like Zika, which can be transmitted via blood transfusion, what other diseases should we be uh, paying attention to that this, this innovative work can help to re reduce the likelihood that that pathogen is passed through blood? Let me, let me take that one. Um, when I joined the American Red Cross in 2002, uh, the first Thanksgiving after I arrived, I remember vividly reading an article in, in the New York Times of a number of patients um, who got West Nile virus through a blood transfusion, including one that died. Uh, this West Nile was very current at the time on the East Coast, and we just didn't know or dream that it was transmitted by blood. And we got a rude shock um, that weekend because there was, there was a clear case of transmission. Um, and we waited a year before a test was available for West Nile virus. And we know that uh, dozens of patients were infected with West Nile. That's a mosquito-borne disease um, during that year. Subsequent to that, um, when I was working with the American Red Cross, we collected and distributed blood in Puerto Rico. Uh, and they had outbreaks of first dengue and then chikungunya, and then finally Zika. And while I was chief medical officer, I actually approached Cirrus Corporation and said, what could they do to help us in Puerto Rico? So one of the first places in the US to use the Cirrus technology was actually the American Red Cross in Puerto Rico, where we implemented it to protect the um, patients against chikungunya, which is a mosquito-borne disease. And then, of course, two years later, we had Zika come through and, and sweep Puerto Rico, the Caribbean islands, Brazil, and the southern, um, uh, southern parts of, of the U.S. Just to make it very personal, there's actually a, a dengue mosquito-borne virus outbreak happening today in, in the southern parts of Florida, in Miami. There's actually local transmission of dengue. Again, it... it, it blood-borne pathogen that we don't test for in the blood supply. So, so it is very current. And so it sounds like there's an ever-present need for continuing to understand emergent diseases and pathogens, um, and also to better understand the ones we think we already know. Absolutely. Yeah. Actually, another, another great story is um, Dr. Larry Korash, our founder back in the late 80s, one of the first experiments he did was with uh, non-A, non-B hepatitis. He was working at the National Institute of Health, um, and Dr. Harvey Alter, who won the Nobel Prize this year, 
for his work in non-A, non-B hepatitis. Uh, Larry Koresh had the opportunity to, to try the technology in chimpanzees with uh, Dr. Alter. Um, and so the tie to hepatitis C and the work at the NIH has been very strong through the years um, at Cirrus. Uh, and Dr. Alter has written some uh, very strong supportive um, pieces on the technology and the need for pathogen reduction. So we were very pleased this year when we saw that our colleague, because uh, I think many of us know him well, um, actually was awarded the Nobel Prize for that work. That's incredible. Congratulations to that. It's a, it's amazing how innovation stories can build over the years and, um, and inter, interweave and overlap. I, I have a burning question I'm sure most listeners are curious about, which is what about COVID-19? What do we know about its ability to transmit through blood? And is this something that, uh, that risk can be reduced in some of the technologies that you've created? Maybe I should take that. Yeah, Richard, one. You, yeah you should. Yeah. You know, when COVID broke out in southern China end of last year, that was one of the first questions they asked is what about the blood supply? Um, and the truth is, uh, we didn't know for a long time. Uh, there have been a couple of publications that have looked at a small number of, of donations. And we know that if it happens, it's infrequent. We do know that in, when patients are very, very ill, they can have the virus in their blood, um, but very, very ill patients aren't blood donors. The donors that are asymptomatic are the ones you're worried about. Um, and uh, it, it, it is in the blood, but very rarely. And so it's not considered to be a um, major blood threat. But let's be clear that that was pure luck. The next, the next pandemic we have could be just as well uh, blood transfusion transmitted without us knowing it. And it takes many, many months after a disease is discovered to actually work out what the risks are. And during that period, patients may be exposed and may be at risk. Which is likely why pathogen reduction is so important and ideal um, in order to help prevent against that, or at least have a safety net available so that we're not having to um, you know, unknowingly put people in danger through the blood supply. Absolutely. Yeah, indeed, that, that's, uh, you know, increasingly been recognized also by the FDA. Uh, we just were awarded a $11 million grant from the FDA to develop sort of next generation pathogen reduction technologies because they believe we're on the right path to safeguarding uh, the blood supply for red cells, platelets, and plasma. But having a whole blood pathogen activation technology would also be helpful. And, and I think just in light of pandemic preparedness, uh, a lot of government agencies like the FDA, but also uh, U.S. BARDA, which you've probably heard about, which is funding a lot of the, the COVID-19 vaccine development, has also provided Cirrus with a lot of money over the years to support the innovation that exists at the company. Congratulations. It's exciting to see it getting supported. And I'd love to know too, can you share with us a little bit more about the innovation story, the path um, that, that brought you to the point where this technology is today? Was it a clear, you know, going from point A to point B? Was it a circuitous path? How, how, um, how did the story change over time? Yeah, I think, you know, it, it, the technology was originally developed out of both UCSF with Dr. Larry Koresh, who we've already mentioned, but also a number of scientists out of uh, UC Berkeley who were actually photochemists. And so they uh, were developing uh, different chemistries uh, that are activated by UVA light. It's actually an interesting uh, sort of natural uh, phenomenon that that plants have these photochemicals in them and they're sort of a natural insecticide. So when insects eat the, the chemicals uh, and then go out into the sunlight, it, it actually uh, kills the, the insects and it sort of uh, prevents uh, the plants from being eaten. Um, and so the, the innovation story really was, well, how do you take that and uh, derivatize those uh, compounds into something that ultimately could inactivate pathogens and blood components without inactivating uh, the blood components themselves. And that was developed in the, the early 90s. And, you know, it took a while uh, to have something that easily could be configured into blood center operations around the globe. 
our technology today is implemented in both small blood centers like in Tahiti uh, to large blood centers in the United States at the American Red Cross, uh, for example. Uh, but, you know, it really took a while for uh, the technology to be broadly implemented. And it's still, uh, in fact, uh, being uh, sort of gradually deployed. So it's not a, a foregone conclusion that pathogen activation should be the foundational strategy for blood safety. Uh, I think the, the evolution of testing over time, you know, and, and its uh, efficiency uh, worked. But as, as more and more pathogens enter the blood supply, it gets harder and harder for uh, to have a system that that actually is sustainable, and, and so that's again why we see uh, agencies like the Food Food and Drug Administration really, you know, looking at pathogen activation as sort of the definitive safeguard for the long term. Uh, to maybe add a little bit to the innovation story, you know, as as the company has rolled out the technology, uh, we obviously are always on the lookout for how do we improve uh, the technology, how do we iterate on it so that it's easier to use and more cost effective. But also we see opportunities for uh, partnering with our blood centers you know, to try and create uh, solutions for uh, specific patient needs. And one of those is, is a product that we hope to have FDA approval on by the end of this year. Uh, it's a, a product called cryo precipitate, which is used in critically bleeding patients. Uh, and the, the problem that we were trying to solve for, for physicians like trauma doctors and, and OB-GYN uh, physicians who treat maternal hemorrhage is that they don't have the product readily available because it's a, it's a frozen product typically, and it's also not configured in, in the dosage that, that makes the most sense. And so at the company, we figured, well, if we can use our technology to sterilize the component, maybe it can sit out at room temperature uh, for a week, and then will be readily available whenever a physician needs it for a patient who might be dying from from blood loss from a car accident or from childbirth. Wow, that's absolutely incredible. So, so is that then? Did that is that happening now? <laughs> yeah, no, it is. So we've uh, we've submitted to the FDA for the approval of the product, and uh, we hope to launch it uh, by the end of this year, or early next. And uh, it's one of those things that we believe will really change patient outcomes because uh, it's you know, broadly known that the leading cause of death for people under the age of 40 years old is, is traumatic blood loss, either from you know, car accidents or, or, um, or gunshots or maternal hemorrhage, which is a big uh, cause of mortality for, uh, for women uh, of childbearing years. Uh, so. And the, and the goal there is to really intervene as early as possible uh, when a patient is, is losing a lot of blood so that you can prevent the need for even more uh, blood components being transfused. You know, when you talk about technologies that are so have such meaningful impacts on society and at the individual level, the, my next question might seem uh, like, like it's maybe easy to answer, but I was curious to know how you connect your audiences to the impacts made through your innovations. And, and maybe this is a good time to, to ask who are the audiences that you speak to as you work to put your technologies out into the world and how do their different needs, you know, impact the way that you connect with them and, and help reveal what the, what impacts are made possible. Yeah, I'd say that the uh, the main audience for us and the story that we're telling are blood centers and hospitals. And so, you know, for blood centers, they have a very difficult job. I mean, Richard probably can expand on this uh, better than I can. But you know, the you know, the necessity of maintaining the blood supply with all the variations associated with bringing donors in the door, making sure that they're eligible due to no donate blood, making sure that you then can process those uh, blood components and then distribute them across uh, all the hospitals in the United States. And that's a big job. And uh, so, you know, what we're hoping to do is, is show them that with a technology like ours, at least, you know, a lot of their concerns can be addressed, whether it's donor availability. Uh, so a lot of donors, blood donors are deferred from donation because of concerns about uh, uh, transfusion transmitted disease from from mosquitoes, for example. So you have malaria or dengue or chikungunya, like Richard mentioned before. So if, uh, if you're in the United States and, and you travel to Mexico for vacation, for example, you are banned from donating blood for that period of time. There are other donor deferrals like tattoos because uh, 
uh, blood centers and, and uh, transfusion specialists are, are concerned about, you know, some kind of disease transmission from the tattoo needles to the, to the donor. And then, you know, one that's gotten a lot of press is around uh, gay male donor referrals. So based upon the history with HIV, um, there's been many decades now in which uh, uh, gay men are, are not allowed to donate blood. And that's only recently been modified so that now there's a three month donor deferral for, for gay men. Um, and so, you know, I think, uh, you know, basically what we're trying to do is, is take, uh, the technology development that we have at Cirrus and make it real to these blood centers and hospitals as to the problem that we're trying to solve for them. And, and also, you know, ultimately for, for patients. Not only are we trying to make blood safer, but we're trying to make better blood products. So uh, if in a, in a platelet transfusion, if you don't need the plasma uh, and you take it out and replace it with an additive solution so that you get fewer allergic reactions to that platelet, but the platelet is just as potent at stopping bleeding, that would be a better product. Uh, uh, Obi mentioned cryoprecipitate. We, we haven't really changed what the cryoprecipitate does, but we make it more available and more readily available to patients when they actually need it. So, uh, you know, it's an improvement that's not just in safety, but also in availability and usability um, of blood. You know, over, over the last uh, 10 years, there's been a tremendous move away from transfusion in, uh, in medical circles. The country actually uses 30% less red cell transfusions than we did 10 years ago. And part of that is driven by doctors who are worried about the safety of blood products. And um, what we've learned is how to more appropriately use blood when it's really needed, and then not to use it when uh, it's not really needed. And so we believe that our products, uh, by making them more available and safer, uh, give physicians some confidence in the use of their blood products as well. So the, the, the whole industry around transfusion is, I think, quite rapidly improving, and we are part of that innovation uh, for patients. Absolutely. I, this brings me to a question about transparency too. Uh, to what degree, from the that you you spoke so beautifully to the way that you need to meet the needs and and solve the problems faced by blood centers and hospitals and health systems. And I'm thinking, of course, their mission is always at the end to serve the patient. And from a patient perspective, how much transparency is there around whether the blood that they're receiving or the blood components they're receiving um, are sterilized or have gone through some of these processes? It's a really good question. Uh, you can imagine that when you arrive in an emergency room, having just been in a motor vehicle accident, this is not the thing you're worried about. Right. And, and we'll probably only think about, you know, three weeks later as you're lying back in your bed at home thinking, oh, I wonder, wonder what, what happened to those 10 units of blood I required? Where did they come from? Who were the donors? Was it safe? On the other hand, if you're a cancer patient, and you're getting a transfusion of a plated product every week or every couple of days, and you know that over the next six months you're going to require 40, 50 uh, blood products, this is something you have time to think about. Today, if you, you know, it very much is dependent on the hospital you go to. Um, some hospitals use pathogen reduction technologies today and some don't. And you don't really have a say in, in, in what, what happens. And that's one of the unfortunate things about um, how, the, how the system works is that the ultimate end user is not the person who gets to make the choice um, or even to understand what the, ch what, the, uh, uh, what the choices could be. So, you know, if we could get to communicate with the ultimate end user patients, that would be wonderful. Uh, but that is, that's, that's a difficult thing to do. It reminds me of, you know, something being certified organic or have, having a sort of cer <laughs> certified, uh, sorry, that's a terrible metaphor. But yeah, I was thinking, of, you know, fair trade or the other things that people stand behind from the consumer's perspective and say, I believe in that and I want to get behind it. And granted, the stakes here are a hundredfold more critical than that. But um, 
but yeah, it would be interesting to see more transparency or a level of demand coming from uh, citizens to say, hey, we we think that this should be a standard or we have a right to know. Yeah, you know where I think it could be the most apparent is on the blood donation side. Obi mentioned um, the, the issue that perhaps our technology can prevent deferrals of, of donors who've been to malaria at risk areas or, or, or gay men. Um, there's nothing more demoralizing for a blood donor to walk in and want to volunteer, uh, to, to give blood and walk into a, a um, donor center and to be turned away. Um, and if we could do anything to, uh, to, to lessen that, uh, that burden, then I think we will help the supply tremendously and also help donors feel a lot better about giving blood and supporting patients. Absolutely. That's a really beautiful point. That's, it's so important. Uh, thank you for sharing that. I, I would love to know what advice you would give to innovators. I, I, you know, you've mentioned so many powerful stories around this innovative work and uh, thinking of things from multiple perspectives. And I, I'm curious to know what what advice would you give to others as they pr- prepare to convey what are, you know, what we've talked about is fairly medically complex. And so how would you recommend that other clinicians or clinical researchers work to convey their great ideas to investors or to the audiences that most need to understand them in order to help change medicine for the better? Yeah, I think that it really comes down to the, the mission of the company at the end of the day and having a very clear focus on that that, that lasts uh, over time and perseveres. So the company was founded on, on the basis of trying to improve blood safety and availability back in the early 90s. And that mission has never changed. It's allowed us to recruit people into the company who feel uh, very compelled by that mission and passionate about what we're trying to do, given the scope of, of the uh, the impact that we'll have on patient outcomes globally and the number of patients who receive our technology on a day, uh, receive blood components treated with our technology on a daily basis. It also serves to align uh, all the, the folks at Cirrus and at any company around a common goal. And at the end of the day, there's you know, always trade-offs with regard to priorities, especially as companies grow. If you can stay true to that singular mission, uh, it, it really is critical. And it also helps, you know, with the overall storytelling about sort of, you know, how the company has evolved from stage A to stage B to stage C, if you will. Uh, and, and, and sort of you, you can tell a, a story um, of, of, of founding, but also a story of perseverance and a story of, of success. And I think my journey to Cirrus when I joined five years ago is a good example of that. I first met the founder in about 1998 when I was a um, director of a blood bank in Boston at one of the Harvard hospitals. Um, and Dr. Koresh came in to, um, he wanted to do a large clinical trial in patients. And, and, I, and I was one of the investigators in that trial in the late 90s and early 2000s. So um, it's amazing when you, when, you, when you actually meet folks that are very mission driven and you can align with that. Um, how 15 years later, it, it wasn't a difficult decision to call up um, Obi and say, you know, I really want to come work for you. And that's pretty much how it happened. Uh, (laughs) And, um, you know, the mission, the the importance of patients and working with extremely smart people who are good at what they do. Um, I think that's, you you couldn't really ask for a, um, a better combination. I love that story. And I think it speaks to exactly what Obi was saying as well, that sharing those stories of your personal reasons why you're there and also continuing to transform those personal reasons into organizational narratives to help us reflect back who we are and, of course, form all of your employees in 
in alignment with that mission. I think storytelling is, uh, you know, bottom up and top down at the same time in strong organizations. And it sounds like um, Cirrus is a, a powerful example of that, where there's a clarity of mission and story coming from leadership, but also individual employees having an important and critical role to play in the enactment of that mission and sharing their individual stories from the bottom up will then continue to shape and tweak the direction um, of the, the larger brand story. Absolutely. Well, thank you both so much for being on the podcast. This has been incredible. Where can our listeners find out more about the both of you, uh, Cirrus, and the technologies you, you shared with us today? Well, we've got a, a great website. It's www.cirrus.com. And I think we also have a, a pretty uh, strong presence on LinkedIn and some other uh, social media uh, venues. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, follow us on online. And uh, really grateful for the opportunity to talk about uh, the Cirrus Innovation Story today and also uh, the whole transfusion medicine community and the unsung heroes out there in blood banking who have really uh, kept the, uh, the U.S. healthcare system going uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic. So thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Yes. Enjoy. Yes. Thank you. And thank you for, for that shout out to all of the, the healthcare providers who are working on the front lines and in blood banks. You're right. They think that they are unsung heroes. That's true. Well, thank you both. And I hope to talk to you really soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Katie. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content. 